1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15 tonight for the message. And um, First Corinthians 15, we want to begin reading down in verse 41. First Corinthians 15 and 41. The Bible says, "There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon." And another glory of the stars, for one star differeth from another star in glory. Lord, I pray that you would help us think about that tonight. And Father, that uh, the principles that you lay out in the surrounding context here would be an encouragement to us, and especially with regard to our future, that is, for all who know Christ as Savior. Speak to our hearts from your word tonight, and I'll thank you, Lord, please, in Jesus' name, amen. Well, of course, you know, today was the funeral for our brother Fred Dunford, and as I was praying about uh, the message to bring for the funeral service, uh, the Lord spoke to my heart at the same time about the message to bring for tonight, and that message has to do with resurrection. You can't face the death of death of a Christian without thinking about the resurrection. There's a great deal of uh, uh, controversy sometimes surrounding resurrection that can uh, just simply be settled by looking into God's Word and receiving it for what it says. And we see Paul describing the resurrected state of the believer in this last half of the uh, uh, 15th chapter of the book of First. Corinthians. And throughout the Bible, in the New Testament, I should say, in different places, we find uh, the, the authors of the Scripture uh, dealing with those who, for some reason or another, uh, have a problem with belief in the resurrection. And um, uh, I remember years ago, uh, Pastor Harold defining the different groups in the Bible. You had the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the Pharisees were fundamental. They pretty much believed what you and I might believe uh, with regard to the resurrection, but the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection, and that's why they were sad, you see. Those, that's the kind of deep theology Pastor Harold would give us <laughs> at Misawa from time to time. Uh, but uh, indeed, if you, if you can't accept the power of the living God to resurrect bodies from the dead, you, uh, you are indeed uh, sad. Uh, I don't, I'm not sure why we want to call God God and then question what he can do. Strange, isn't it? Paul had this same question for Agrippa in Acts 26 and 8. Why should it be thought a thing incredible with you that God should raise the dead? And uh, so, but many people, and sometimes even those that refer to themselves as believers, are, are perplexed by the question of how God could uh, restore uh, all of those that have died in the various fashions and manners throughout all uh, of history. Paul anticipated these questions as he has laid out the doctrine, really, uh, in many ways of the resurrection in the first half of the chapter of 1 Corinthians 15. He then begins to answer some of these questions that he knew uh, would come up uh, into people's mind. The first of one is, uh, how are the dead raised up and with what body do they come? Now, again, uh, if you, uh, uh, you know, can't take a look at uh, uh, one of our brethren, especially like Brother Dunford or maybe even some of the others we've lost in fairly recent history and not think to yourself uh, how you are going to miss them until you see them again and thank God for what he's going to do with regard to the resurrection, something's not clicking right yet. 
uh, in our heart and in our mind. Uh, but I'm thankful as we looked at a real body this afternoon, so there's going to be a real resurrection. Brother Dunford will be raised up and we'll be raised up with him. Paul answers the question, how are the dead raised up and what, with what body do they come? Two questions laid out in verse 35. He says, but some man will say, how are the dead raised up and with what body do they come? How are the dead raised up? How could God raise up all the dead through all the ages of history? How could he do that? And if he can do that, then with what body are they raised? What type of body will they have in the resurrection? Two questions are addressed here. And notice Paul's loving response in verse 36. Thou fool. Now, why, why would he say uh, thou fool? Well, it's clear uh, that the questions obviously being raised are not being raised by someone who really wants the answer. Uh, these questions are coming from uh, someone who is a mocker, who questions the power and the ability of God. And we're reminded that the denial of the resurrection, because it seems impossible, is foolish. Uh, why? Because you and I aren't the ones that... Uh, uh, that uh, have resurrection power. It is the God of heaven that has resurrection power. Now, if, the, if, if somebody in the uh, auditorium tonight were to come and say, look here, I think I'm going to go down there and I'm going to raise Brother Dunford up tonight, we'd think something's wrong with you. Why? We don't have that power. But God has that power to raise the dead. He is omnipotent, meaning, of course, he is all power he has the ability to do anything he wants with the exception of break his own word. Uh, and so God is unlimited in his abilities. And I think uh, connected with this matter of the resurrection is why many believers struggle to have victory in their life and it's because they put God in a box that's not his own making. God is uh, all-powerful, unlimited, if he were limited, he wouldn't be God. If he could create, uh, create the human body but could not restore it, he would not be God. Jesus said in Mark 10 and verse 27, With men it is impossible, but not with God, for with God all things are possible. Hey, that's true of the resurrection. Look out. That's true with regard to God meeting your needs. Uh, that's true with regard to your witness. Uh, that's true with regard to your relationships. With God, all things are possible. That's from the words of our own Savior. Those things that seem impossible for us are the easiest with God. And so he answers this question, this Foolish question, he answers in four ways. First, by an illustration from nature beginning in verse 36, and he starts talking about the matter of planting crops. He says in verse 36 that the seed must first die. Thou fool, he said, that which thou sowest is not quickened except it die. And Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, uh, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. One body must die to give life to another. And uh, one must shed that which is temporal before he can produce that which is eternal. That has application with regard to the resurrection. It also has application in the area of our Christian service and the effectiveness and power of our work for the Lord only takes place as we come to the point of death. That is, death to self. Uh, death to, uh, uh, to everything but God's design and God's perfect will. Death to our desires uh, and alive unto his glory. He said the seed must first die. The point here is this. There is no resurrection unless there's first death. 
He said, when you think about this matter of planting continuing, not only that the seed must first die, but the mature plant is different from the seed. That which thou sowest, verse 37, thou sowest not that body that shall be, but bear grain. It may chance of wheat or some other grain, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him to every seed his own body. And so the corn plant looks nothing like the corn seed. Uh, and uh, Christ's resurrection body, by parallel, was radically different from the body in which he was crucified, from the body that died. Christ's resurrection body was not limited, think about it, by time, by space, or material substance. Now look. And the promise of the Bible is that our resurrected body will be like his. 1 John 3 and 1, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And so the seed's identity continues in the mature plant. Uh, and the seed, the seed changes radically, but it's still the same life form. You don't put corn seed in the ground and get wheat. You get corn. Uh, and uh, that seems pretty simple. Uh, now, uh, we, uh, we see then here uh, an important principle that Christ's resurrection body was greatly different on the other side of the grave. Now, Brother Dunford doesn't have his resurrected body yet, but are you thinking about what he might be doing right now? What do you reckon happened when him and Brother Bryson got back together? Huh? Oh, yeah. And uh, they told, Brother Coffee told a story this afternoon about him swapping Ambien, you know, and how Sister Coffee had gotten on to having uh, some kind of hallucination because... Uh, Brother Dunford had given her an ambient. And I, I told Brother Coffee, I said, look, it shouldn't have surprised anybody if you have seen the commercial, you just got that glowing butterfly on it. And surely you know somebody's going to have some hallucinations if they take some ambient. <laughs> but reckon what happened when they, hey, reckon, uh, reckon if three of them got together. What about Brother Stanfield up there? Huh? You, think, you thinking about what in the world that they're, what's going on in their uh, in their condition and the state that they're in, doesn't it want? If it wasn't sin, we'd be jealous. I'm jealous anyway. <laughs> yeah, uh, and uh, uh, but one day, of course, the point of all of this is that uh, they're going to uh, have, and you and I are going to have a body radically different on the other side of the grave. But the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, was still recognizable to others. That's what verse 38 means, but God giveth it a body as it hath pleased him. Look, and to every seed his own body. Now, when I was a kid, there used to be this, uh, this character by the name of Casper the Ghost. Does anybody remember Casper? Casper. All right, and so some people have the idea that we're all going to be little angel beings and we're all going to look the same. The Bible doesn't teach any such thing. Uh, and it talks still about the, uh, the maintenance, if you will, of the identity. Our bodies will die and change form, but they'll still be our bodies. Resurrection uh, isn't possible. Uh, for some who say the resurrection isn't, uh, is impossible, uh, they don't understand that it occurs on a small scale, even in the plant world, all the time. And so he uses this illustration from nature. And then he uses a comparison from nature, beginning in verse number 39, talking about variety in creation, illustrating variety in resurrection. And here's what he says in verse uh, number 38. Uh, but God giveth it a body as it pleased him, and to every seed his own 
body. Verse 39 tells us all flesh is not the same flesh. Now, all you have to do to figure that out is try beef and liver. That's not the same thing. Uh, and uh, it's not the same. Chicken and fish, it's not the same thing. Even though I did walk into the kitchen the other night, and my wife was getting ready to put some, uh, something in the oven, and I said, where'd you get that fish? She said, it's chicken. <laughs> I said, looks like good chicken. <laughs> Uh, this, look, this is terrible. Verse 39 is terrible trouble for the evolutionist. Uh, because it says again, all flesh is not the same flesh. There is one kind of flesh of men, another of beasts, another of fishes, another of birds. And there is no scientific evidence that one transforms to the other. They are all uh, different. Uh, the variety of the life forms, and then not only, again, illustrating the variety of the resurrection and uh, the variety in the universe, beginning in verse 40 that we read as our text, for there are also celestial bodies and bodies terrestrial. But the glory of the celestial is one, and the glory of the terrestrial is another. There is one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, another glory of the stars, for one star different from another star in glory. Look at verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. Now, I'm, I'm, this, uh, this, uh, this teaching particularly encourages me because as bad as this world is and as difficult as it is in the flesh, uh, you and I are connected with our identity. Right? And... Uh, so much so that, uh, and God, again, having made us triune beings, body, soul, and spirit, for all of a sudden God to take and wipe all that away would be a shock indeed. Now, could God do it? Absolutely he could. He could change our heart and mind to where it wouldn't even matter. But here's the thing. Think about this. God knows how important <laughs> we are one to another. And those importance and those connections and those relationships come because of the difference of our personage and identity. <laughs> I'm not you, and you're not me. And you're thanking God for that. And so in the, <laughs> in the resurrected body, isn't that wonderful? Uh, we're, going to, uh, we're going to maintain that type of identity into our resurrected body. And so he says here that even among the, uh, even among the sun and the moon, uh, there's a distinction. Even among the stars, there are different, uh, there are different glories, verse 42. And so, uh, look, when Moses and Elijah appeared with Christ on the Mount of Transfiguration, they were as distinct as they were on earth. And we said just recently in one of the messages that Peter recognized it. He recognized the transfigured Christ. He recognized the transfigured Elijah. He knew them uh, as the individuals that they were. Matter of fact, uh, Peter didn't even know Elijah. Think about that. Never seen him before in his life. Uh, and yet in this resurrected state, Peter recognized who was there. And, uh, oh, doesn't it make you want to just go on and enjoy the wonder of it all right now? <laughs> How God is going to put all of this uh, together uh, for our future resurrection. Uh, here's the point. Uh, we will live and be alive in heaven as the same person we were on earth. And our resurrection bodies will be as individual as our spirit and our name only perfected. Now, I know that most of us get up in the morning, look in the mirror, and we think to ourselves, you sorry scoundrel, I wish you'd straighten up. Did you know one day, <laughs> hey, glory, you're going to know you perfected? You don't even have any clue what that might be like tonight. 
but God does. And one of these days, he's going to perfect us in our resurrected bodies. And so he gives this illustration from nature, and he gives this comparison from nature. And then he used some contrasts uh, beginning in the verse number 42, how that there's a difference. And thank the Lord for it. There's a difference between the spiritual and the natural. And so he talks about the difference between corruption and incorruption, beginning in first, uh, verse 42. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. I don't need to tell you tonight that these bodies are born subject to deterioration. And they're, they're born subject to decay. The moment we're born, we begin to die. And uh, uh, we're born with perishable bodies. And the older we get, the weaker and more susceptible we become to disease and to physical problems. But our resurrected bodies will have no such problem. Uh, hold your place there and go over to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter number 1. And verse 3 1 Peter 1 and 3, all this, of course, is connected with our election in salvation to, the, uh, to God and the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he says in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you. And so he tells us that one of these days, brother, we're moving from corruption to incorruption. And then he talks about the difference between uh, dishonor and glory in verse 33. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. You and I were man, I should say, was made in the image of God and brought glory to God in the beginning. But when Adam fell, man was plunged into dishonor and sin. But our immortal bodies will be honorable bodies that will again bring glory to God for all eternity. He contrasts dishonor and glory. Then he contrasts weakness and power. There again in verse 33, it is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. These natural bodies that we're in are weak physically. We may have some strength, but we still get sick, we still break bones and all such the like. Natural bodies are also, I know we have a hard time admitting it, not only are we weak physically, but ultimately, in comparison to God, we are weak mentally. You and I don't even begin to scratch the surface of the ability of the human brain. We can't even figure it out. They're trying, and they keep studying. Uh, but, uh, brother, it is a miracle creation of God. Uh, and so our resurrected body, though, will be raised in power so that we will no longer have to say, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Martin Luther said it this way, as weak as it, is, as it the human body is now without all power and ability when it lies in the grave, just so strong will it be when the time arrives so that not a thing will be impossible for it if it has the mind for it, and it will be so light and agile that in an instant it can float uh, here below on earth or above in heaven. Limitation, all gone. And uh, somebody said, how can that be? Well, you remember the Savior. The Savior entered right into the presence of the disciples through a locked door in his resurrected body. And when we see him, <laughs> we shall be like him. So he contrasts weakness and power. And then, of course, in verse 44, he says, It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body, and there is a spiritual body. Right now, right now, as, as bad even as we'd like to, 
uh, go on into heaven, we are not in these bodies able to live any place but in this natural realm. Now, certainly God has designed our body in a marvelous way for such a life, but we are still limited. I was thinking about the other day that when they first, uh, I read somewhere that when they first started uh, working on the automobile, they were a little bit, you know, when it was an open top and all that, and so they were a little bit concerned about its effect on the body. Anybody ever read this? So that they said they, they had figured up that if you got the vehicle up to 40 miles an hour, it would peel your skin off. <laughs> uh, and so uh, uh, that certainly is not the case. I mean, all you got to do is watch these guys on these motorcycles coming down 17, and you know that's not true. The, the skin don't peel until the bike falls over, and then it peels, all right? But uh, uh, before that, I think it's all right. Uh, uh, but uh, we, we, we're, we're, we're suited wonderfully for, for here. But we're not ready for glory yet. Our resurrection bodies will be changed so that in every way we'll be suited for living in heaven. Now listen, we're not going to become angels. When we die, you see, sometimes you see this, uh, uh, we you know, had a funeral day and sometimes you have a funeral service and Somebody would talk about somebody passing away and, and becoming an angel. And that's not in the Bible. Uh, the, the Bible says that the angels as created by God, uh, they, they look at us and give honor and glory to God because of salvation in Jesus Christ. They're an entire different created being. Angels. We're not going to become an angel. Uh, and, uh, uh, but at the same time, we'll have bodies that will be able to dwell in their presence, we'll have bodies that will be able to live heavenly, spiritual, supernatural lives. And so then he goes from contrast to a prototype, beginning in verse 45, when he says, and so, and so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, that's Christ, was made a quickening spirit. Adam was a living soul. Christ became a life-giving spirit. Uh, Romans 5 and verse 17 tells us, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, so much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. But the point is this. In both Adam and Christ's case, uh, the natural body came first. Verse 46, Howbeit he that was not first uh, he, excuse me, how be it that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man came from the earth, verse 47, is of the earth earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven, verse 48. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. As is the heavenly, such are they also that are heavenly. And isn't that something? We're going to know both. No angel can say that. But you and I are going to be able to say it. We are in the natural now, and we rejoice in the thought that the spiritual is coming. How are the dead raised up, and what body do they come? And, uh, uh, I mean, if you're, in a, if you're living in... Uh, uh, if you're uh, living the Ferris now, and maybe you think you're going to go incognito in glory, you've got another thing coming. Uh, it's going to be you, only in a glorified body. So he says, when are the dead, the second question, when are the dead raised up, and what happens to the living in verse number 15? Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. So what are we going to do? That's the problem listed out in verse 50. We're not ready uh, to inherit uh, because corruption cannot inherit corruption. And even the Lord's body was transformed and glorified before he was received up into glory. So ours also must be changed. The problem is met with the solution. Uh, beginning in verse number 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. Now, in the Bible, a mystery is something that was unknown before but is now revealed in the New Testament. This mystery is the rapture. The resurrection. 
the glorified body. When God changes us, I show you mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. We're not all going to die, but we are all going to have to be changed. And so the Old Testament prophets, when they were looking across uh, what God had revealed to them in the ages, they saw the first coming and they saw the second coming, but they did not see uh, the church age in the rapture. That time was as a, as a valley between two mountaintops. They didn't see it. But Paul gives it to us here. He tells us that the, we will not all die. We're not all going to die. Yeah, we're not all going to die. Not everybody uh, is going to have a funeral. Not everybody is going to have to experience uh, that transition. And if you and I believe that the, uh, the very next event on God's calendar is the rapture, that change could happen tonight. Hey, wouldn't it be good if we didn't have to have another funeral in this house? Wouldn't it be wonderful if we were all just changed? And we will be. Uh, he talks about in the last part of verse 51, we shall all be changed. And he describes it in verse 52, in a moment, in a twinkle of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. Now, that ties in, of course, with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We looked at it at the graveside this afternoon, and that is that the dead in Christ shall be raised first. Here's the thing about God allowing you to go through the door of death. You see all of it first. Amen. And you say, well, now, what does that matter in a twink of an eye? I don't know, but in a spiritual body, it's got to mean something. You know who's going to get it first? <laughs> Brother Dumford. <laughs> Brother Stanfield. Brother Bryson. Sister Bryson. In a moment, the dead in Christ shall be raised first. First of all, it's going to happen at the last trump. That, that uh, word, moment, translates a word from which we get our word Adam, A-T-O-M. The smallest conceivable element. Think about it. Have you heard, I guess uh, I, I'm going to probably, well, I do it all the time anyway, show my ignorance. But they talk about nano, nanoseconds. Are you, are you, is that right? They're trying to figure out what the smallest element of time is. I bet you they don't do it. But I bet you God knows it. And in that smallest element of time, we're changed. We're changed. Uh, we'll be mo uh, moved from mortal to immortal, from natural to spiritual, from dishonor to glory, from corruptible to incorruptible. And it'll have to happen in verse 33, for, uh, 53. For, excuse me. For this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. It's not a matter of it'd be nice if it's going to happen. It must happen. And by God's grace and strength and power, it will happen. Here's the thing. If you're saved tonight, you're going to know it. One way or the other. Have you ever had somebody experience something and you thought to yourself, boy, I wish I could do that? You know, for some reason, people watch other people jump out of airplanes and they say, boy, I wish I could do that. Yeah, not me. You know, <laughs> I remember we were on deputation traveling to this church in South Carolina and, uh, and uh, they had, were having a church field day. And uh, one of the guys in the church worked for the electric company down there and he brought out one of their big bucket trucks. And that bucket would raise up there, you know, about 75 feet or so. Uh, and um, lo and behold, they were taking the kids for rides in that bucket. So what I did was, because I'm afraid of heights, what I did was steer my kids like those roosters. I said, don't, let's don't look back there. Nothing back there for you to see. But Alicia, y'all know Alicia, she saw it. 
and she had to get in the bucket. Uh, and so uh, being the dad, I had to try to show myself something other than scared, which was not true. And so I, I got in the bucket, and up we went, and this guy was a real prankster. I could use another word, but I won't. And so because he was used to this bucket, you know, uh, he uh, would stretch that thing all the way up and then lay his arm all the way out until it hit the ends, you know, down there somewhere, and it would go boom, and the whole truck would do like this. Yeah. And I said, hey, I didn't even want to call him brother at that moment. I said, okay, great, put it down. Put it down. And he said, you know how people sometimes, he said, what's the matter, preacher? He, <laughs> he said, uh, he said uh, what's the matter, you, uh, you scared of heights? I said, oh, man, I'm scared of heights. I am scared of heights. He said, uh, what are you going to do at the, at the rapture? I said, hey, big boy, I'll be in a glorified body. Put this bucket down. And call me preacher. I'll throw some theology on you. <laughs> and uh, so he did, and we made it. And I don't think Courtney wanted to go, so I was, I was thankful for that. Uh, but uh, it's, it, it, so people, people see people experience stuff. And like, oh, I wish I could do that, and they never get a chance to. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. Every one of us is going to experience the change. The wonder of going from corruption to incorruption. From mortal to immoral. Every one of us. Listen, and not one. It's not like where you got to go to some of these uh, uh, theme parks and pay $195 to get in. No, no. Listen, Jesus paid the ticket. Jesus paid the ticket. And you and I are going to get to experience that wonderful transformation because it must take place according to verse 53 so that you and I will finally then have victory over death uh, and the grave. Verse 54 tells us, So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Now, over the last little while, we've had a lot of funerals for a lot of the Lord's people at Maranatha Baptist Church. And the uh, Spicers are going through it right now. And uh, doesn't it kind of pull you down a little bit? Somebody else got cancer. Somebody else health failing. Somebody else has died and families are hurting. Do you ever just think about it and maybe hear the calls or come to the services and say to yourself, oh, dear God, when will it ever be over? We have the promise in the word that one day it will finally be over. It will finally be over. When? This corruptible shall have put on incorruption. When this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that it is, that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Here it is. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Somebody said that death, death can have no sting because Jesus pulled it out. The grave can have no victory because he won it on Calvary. The sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks. And when you and I see verse 56, we're whipped. You know why? Because this flesh. We're whipped. Somebody, somebody said, uh, I think I told you one time we was out visitat vis visitating. <laughs> we were out visiting and at uh, one time, and, uh, uh, you know, I uh, uh, asked this the person on the porch. I said, uh, well, you know you're going to heaven when you die? They said, sure. Do. I said, awesome. Don't hear that quite a bit. So how do you know you're going to heaven when you die? Because I keep the Ten Commandments. Now, I know from the Bible that ain't right. Huh? I know from the Bible that's not right. Uh, and and uh, so when you and I are up against the law in the flesh, we're done. 
We're finished. Uh, there's no hope for us. Uh, of the sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Verse 57, but, <laughs> but thanks be to God, God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Watch. What does it mean to us then? What does that mean? Do you believe it? And I guess the thing, that's what runs through our minds sometimes. When you see, see Brother Dunford laid out here this afternoon for a little bit, maybe last night you were able to make it to the visitation there, others uh, that we could mention tonight as well. But uh, do you think about that body out of there? What should that do for us? How should that help us? Verse 58 tells us, Therefore, because of all that, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. It's not in vain in the Lord. And that we quote that. Many people quote that verse all the time. But forget, it's connected with the promise of the resurrection. We don't do what we do because of all the goody down here. We do it for what's coming. And, that, and, and it reminds us then, doesn't it, to keep our eyes on what's coming. That is the resurrected, glorified state where we, build, we will be, according to the Bible, reunited in the, uh, with our loved ones, saved loved ones and friends in the air. And so shall we, don't you love those words, ever be with the Lord. Amen. Let's stand together and bow our heads for prayer.